This video is part of an audiobook series featuring The Creative Curve, How to Develop the Right Idea at the Right Time by Alan Gannett. For more audiobooks, please visit my YouTube channel or my website for downloads. Part 2. The Four Laws of the Creative Curve Chapter 7. Law Number 1. Consumption It was 1982, and the Arizona Video Cassettes West was packed with customers. The checkout line snaked back past the comedy section, through horror, and into international. The store was one of the first video rental stores in Arizona, but that wasn't why customers were willing to wait in line for 20 minutes longer. If you had asked the men and women why they were standing there, their reply would have been nonsensical. They were all waiting in line to talk to the clerk, Ted. More to the point, many of them had spent all that afternoon thinking about what question they would ask him. Why? Ted was an 18-year-old community college student. To earn extra money, he worked at Arizona Video Cassettes West, stocking shelves and checking out rentals. Ted's childhood was chaotic. His parents were just teenagers when his mother had him, and before long, he had four additional siblings running around their small house in the Phoenix suburbs. To escape the disorder at home, Ted took to visiting his grandmother's house, where he would watch endless hours of television. Ted's grandmother loved show business, which was reflected in the piles of entertainment magazines overflowing on every surface and piece of furniture. She enchanted Ted with stories about the actors of the day, referring to them by their first names as if recalling old flames. For Ted, movies and television became the ultimate escape from his own chaotic household. Not only was Ted's household in perpetual disarray, but so were the family's finances. His parents loved to spend money they didn't have, and any earnings his parents brought home were quickly spent on new gadgets and electronics. The land, though the landline would be disconnected from time to time because of unpaid bills, Ted's was one of the few families in the neighborhood to already own a VCR. One day, when Ted was biking around town, he noticed a new shop in one of the local strip malls, a video rental store. Thanks to the VCR his parents owned and the time he spent with his grandmother, Ted had grown up lo loving movies, so the new video rental store was a fantasy come true. Ted went inside and started chatting with the store owner, Dale Mason, who was behind the counter wearing a tracksuit. This was the 1980s, after all. Ted soon learned the man's life story. Dale had, become an, had been an air traffic controller in Chicago before deciding to become an entrepreneur. He had read a magazine article that predicted that yogurt shops and video stores would be the biggest business of the decade. Quote, I hate yogurt and love movies, end quote, he told Ted, and his path was set. Dale soon moved to Arizona, where he was able to afford both a house and a small retail space. Over the next few days, Ted returned to the video store, spending hour after hour in conversation with Dale. The two of them talked about movies as Ted made his way around the store, organizing the shelves for fun. It was clear that Ted felt completely at home amid hundreds of videos, and it took Dale no time at all to realize he had found a kindred spirit. He offered Ted a job as a clerk, and Ted accepted, happy to be surrounded by VHS tapes. Most video rental stores were empty during the day. Customers typically rented movies after coming home from work. Rather than doing his homework during his quiet shifts, Ted made a pact with himself that he would watch every single movie in the store. He wanted to learn everything he possibly could about films, and finally he had the best possible resource, a well-stocked video store at his disposal. A few months later, after watching nearly every movie on the store shelves, Ted had morphed into a human recommendation engine. If you were a customer who liked Woody Allen movies, Ted would suggest you try the movies of Albert Brooks, announcing that, quote, what Woody Allen is to New York, Albert Brooks is to L.A., end quote. Like a particular action movie, Ted had three other movie suggestions that would keep your blood flowing in just the same way. Ted, in short, had developed cultural awareness, a real-time consciousness of what is familiar, what is good, and what is cliché. It is this skill that allows someone to identify where exactly an idea or product falls on the creative curve. By going on a consumption binge, Ted, at age 18, had become a movie expert, a film sommelier, in other words. He understood what made people tick, 
and customers, aware of his insight about what to watch and wanting to benefit from his perspective, were willing to wait and wait to talk to him. Similar to the restaurant critic, whom diners trust to to point out the best new places to eat, individuals with this type of awareness are valued in society. We seek them out. We refer to them as tastemakers and influencers. We even promote them to leaders in companies and in our culture. Cultural awareness, being able to identify where an idea follows on the creative curve, may appear to be out of most people's reach. While the food critic, the hip artist, and the successful mobile app founder all understand consumers, it's hard to imagine how the rest of us could gain that same skill. The thing is, we can. In this chapter, we'll explore how and why consumption can enable you to learn this skill and we'll learn how this can also be used to purposefully increase the number of aha moments you have. Is it luck? Some entrepreneurs appear exceedingly lucky, especially the ones who create multiple successful businesses, sometimes even across multiple industries. Entrepreneur Kevin Ryan, for one, founded nine internet companies, including the media company Business Insider, acquired for $450 million, online fashion powerhouse Gilt, acquired for $250 million, and a database technology company, MongoDB, valued at over $1.5 billion. Not only that, but he was part of the early team and served as CEO of the advertising technology pioneer DoubleClick, which was eventually acquired for over $1 billion. From e-commerce to media to database technology, Kevin Ryan is a serial entrepreneur with a shockingly good hit rate. Another successful serial entrepreneur is Martine Rothblatt. As a young lawyer, Rothblatt became fascinated with satellites and co-founded Sirius Radio. Today, in the wake of its merger with XM, Sirius XM or with XM Radio, Sirius XM is valued at over 25 billion. Yet, when her daughter was diagnosed with pulmonary pulmonary hypertension, a lethal and incurable disease that affects the lungs, Rothblatt left Sirius Radio and decided to reinvent herself. After After taking courses in biology, she founded United Therapeutics, a biotech startup devoted to creating treatments for pulmonary hypertension and other similar lung diseases. Today, United Therapeutics is a public company valued at over $5 billion. Whereas most people would struggle to create even one great business, Ryan and Rothblatt have created multiple runaway successes. More impressive still, they were able to switch industries along the way while still achieving extraordinary success. Was it merely genetic luck, or could there be something else at work? Professor Robert Barron, who studies the intersection of entrepreneurship and psychology, wanted to understand how entrepreneurs ferret out opportunities. The answer, he found, is pattern recognition. One of our brain's fundamental tasks is identifying patterns. This task is critical in helping both to protect us and to discover rewarding opportunities. As we discussed, if something poses a threat to us, we want to avoid it. If something promises a potential reward, we want to explore it. Pattern recognition relies on two mental models both of which Professor Barron believes are used by entrepreneurs to come up with new ideas. The first is a prototype, but not the kind of prototype that might immediately come to most people's minds. In psychology, a prototype is an abstraction of any concept's fundamental properties. Think of a coffee shop. A prototype, in this case, would be a small storefront that sells coffee and muffins, has tables, and, depending on how benevolent the owners are, offers free Wi-Fi. Or, in a business context, a prototype of a tech startup would be a young, high-growth-rate company that raises venture capital and offers, it believes, some sort of unique technology. Early on in their careers, entrepreneurs rely heavily on prototypes to guide their decisions. They often absorb these prototypes from books and from the advice of colleagues. For example, let's say an inexperienced entrepreneur, Mike, is interviewing a job applicant, Tom. Mike would probably use a successful employee prototype that he has ingested from outside sources to assess who Tom is and what he could potentially bring to the company, things like being resourceful, curious, responsible, and smart. Mike would have to think carefully about whether or not Tom matched those prototypical characteristics. 
It is a slow, thoughtful process for identifying the familiar. The second mental model is the exemplar, which is basically a specific example of a category. Adam Sandler, for example, is an exemplar of a comedian. Mention the name Adam Sandler and people would categorize him instantly as a comedian. This doesn't mean he's the funniest comedian around, a touchy point in some circles, but instead that he is a specific comedian against whom you can compare others. The same goes for Christmas movies, an exemplar of which would be It's a Wonderful Life. As entrepreneurs gain experience, most start to accumulate concrete examples of a variety of concepts, and over time they rely more and more on exemplars. Using exemplars speeds up idea processing. After all, entrepreneurs don't have to slow down and recognize the individual, distinctive elements of each and every new idea that's presented to them. Most simply accept that this or that new idea matches an exemplar and is familiar. Let's go back to Tom, our aspiring employee, and imagine that he's being re-interviewed by an experienced entrepreneur whom we will call Sally. Sally has worked with numerous people in her career, good and bad, and these colleagues and friends have become, for her, exemplars. Sally would automatically compare Tom to the best or most promising employees she has worked with in the past, and upon deciding that Tom, in some ways, is familiar to a former star colleague, she quickly offers him a job. One critical fa facet of pattern recognition is that it allows entrepreneurs to develop an uncanny instinct for opportunity. Research shows that when entrepreneurs have significant prior knowledge, they no longer need to engage in slow, deliberate searches for new ideas. On the contrary, their prior experience gives them a rich library of exemplars they can access automatically. Experienced entrepreneurs recognize valuable ideas that are familiar to them based on previous valuable experiences. In short, thanks to exemplars, intentional learning and experience make entrepreneurs far more likely to discover a useful new idea as they can effectively recognize what is familiar to the exemplar. Earlier I mentioned serial entrepreneur Kevin Ryan, a successful participant in numerous companies across the tech industry. Kevin has learned to make use of exemplars to find new ideas. He told me how he up, came up with the idea for guilt. Quote, on 18th Street in New York, I was walking by 200 women waiting in line. I asked one of them why they were all lined up like that, and they told me it was all for a Mark Jacobs sample sale, end quote. Kevin was instantly reminded of an exemplar, Vente Privé, a French website that sells discount luxury goods, allowing customers to avoid traveling and waiting for sample sales. Spying the line, he realized that this was potentially more than just a European phenomenon. What about the thousands of other potential customers who loved Marc Jacobs but couldn't make it to New York City that day or hated waiting in lines? In short, he observed something familiar to a successful exemplar. Another example is Jared Paulus, an American politician and entrepreneur and one of the richest members of Congress. According to financial disclosures, he is worth something between $184 and $591 million. The U.S. government likes to keep things broad. Paulus made his fortune as an internet entrepreneur. While attending Princeton, he launched an internet ISP that was later acquired for $23 million. Next, he founded Blue Mountain Greetings, which was acquired during the first internet boom, this time for $760 million in cash and stock. He even started a flower company, ProFlowers.com, which went public and eventually sold for $430 million. As if that weren't enough, he also founded a charter school network and co-founded the high-profile startup accelerator Techstars. Today, though, Jared Paulus is mostly known as a quirky congressman. He is a devoted turtleneck wearer and active video gamer who is currently running for governor in Colorado. We talked on Skype one night about how he used to discover new business ideas. As the research we discussed was shown, has shown, the combination of experience and knowledge makes recognizing new ideas more or less automatic. One day, Jared was sending flowers to a friend and was taken aback by the price list. Why were flowers so expensive? He had no experience in agriculture or in the flower business, but he also knew what a good business looked like, not this, and knew many companies, exemplars, that had benefited from moving to a direct-to-consumer model. 
He trekked around the country, studying the supply chain. I visited growers and flower markets. I visited distributors. I talked to tons of industry players. His mission was to understand where, during this whole process, prices exploded. The result was a completely new model of flower company. Pro Flowers sent flowers directly from the grower to the customer. No middlemen or resellers were needed. This enabled Pro Flowers to deliver fresher flowers for lower prices, creating hundreds of millions of dollars in value, all from an idea that ostensibly appeared in a sudden flash. Experience makes generating familiar ideas easier. But what happens if you don't have experience? Well, there is another way that entrepreneurs can develop exemplars and prototypes. Creative people can also use intentional consumption. Think about Ted, our video store clerk, to achieve similar results. We don't need direct experience to develop prior knowledge. It turns out observing something can be nearly as good as developing exemplars and prototypes. Studies have found that successful entrepreneurs focus on, on ingesting third-party material that is specific to the field they work in. One study found that members of a particular entrepreneurship hall of fame were more likely to find inspiration for new business ideas from reading niche trade and industry publications in contrast to typical entrepreneurs nationwide. Exemplars don't come from consuming just any information. They arise from consuming highly relevant material either within an entrepreneur's field or a field they're considering entering. Through voracious consumption, serial entrepreneurs can develop a set of valuable exemplars, even when they switch to new or unfamiliar industries, as Kevin Ryan and Martine Rothblatt both did. These exemplars, in turn, allow them to identify promising new ideas. A New Perch Over the years, and especially today, Ted Sarandos has continued to en consume an enormous amount of material, in his case, roughly three to four hours of film and TV a day. But he does this from a very different perch, his corner office in Beverly Hills. Ted is now the chief content officer of Netflix, where he has overseen its transformation from a, a DVD rental business to an original programming business that has already won more than 40 Emmys with hit shows like Stranger Things and Orange is the New Black. But let's go back a few years to when Ted dropped out of college to become the general manager of the same video store chain he was working for. This led to an executive role at a video distribution company, and in 2000, he was offered a position at Netflix, leading all content acquisition. Looking back, he describes his video store clerking days as film school and an MBA course all wrapped up in one. Today, working for a company known for its recommendation algorithm, Sarandos jokes, quote, I guess I was using an algorithm years before I even knew what an algorithm was, end quote. Consumption had driven his ability to understand an audience and create content they cared about. By taking in enormous amounts of material, Ted is today the possessor of a vast library of exemplars. This gives him the ability to process new pitches and ideas efficiently, and recognize immediately whether they're original, borrowed, different enough, too different, or somewhere in between. Because of this, Ted and his team have the ability to identify content that hits the ideal spot on the creative curve. It's content that has, as Ted describes it, quote, one foot in familiarity and one foot in something really fresh, unknown, and novel, end quote. A surprising principle Finding new ideas that are familiar to an audience is one of the underpinnings of commercial creativity. From my interviews with today's successful creative artists, I found a surprising pattern. Ted Sarandos' mass consumption of movies and the focused industry-specific consumption of other leading entrepreneurs weren't flukes at all. No matter, no matter whether I was interviewing a painter, a chef, or a songwriter, I'd eventually hear some variation of the same story. Painters show up at numerous art exhibits. Chefs eat at cutting-edge restaurants, visit farms, and travel to food shows. Songwriters are constantly listening to music, new and old. Although these creative artists are typically wildly busy, they consistently spend three to four hours a day, that is to say, roughly 20% of their waking hours, on this kind of consumption. This kind of experience allows them to develop the exemplars necessary to know where an idea falls on the creative curve, as if by gut feel. 
I call this the 20% principle. By spending 20% of your waking hours consuming material in your creative field, you can develop an intuitive, expert-level understanding of the level of familiarity of an idea, where it lies on the creative curve, even without real-world experience. As I explained earlier, studies show us that to master a craft, we need to invest in countless hours of purposeful practice. The 20% principle is different from that. It won't enable anyone to create the perfect omelet, play the violin, or shoot a basketball. The 20% principle isn't about the physical act or about muscle memory. Rather, it enables us to identify the ideas that are appropriately familiar. We still need to call on the skills to execute those ideas or hire the right people who can, but the 20% principle provides the initial electricity for our light bulb moments. In short, the 20% principle allows you to access the creative curve. In order to create content that is familiar, creative people typically call on an extensive base of knowledge. If you are a writer, it's critical to know what books in your category the audience has read and liked. If you paint for a living, you need to understand whether your latest piece lands on the correct point of the creative curve, or whether it risks coming off as trite, passé, or alternatively, hopelessly avant-garde. Consumption provides the fuel, but how do you turn that fuel into a conscious idea? Digital mogul. Connor Franta looks like the most hip LA 20-somethings, tight pants, designer-y t-shirt, and an omnipresent iPhone. A native of Minnesota, he is someone most people wouldn't look at twice if they passed him on the street. But if he walks by a group of teenage girls, you will hear shrieks, and you might even see one or two of them faint. Franta is a YouTube celebrity who started posting videos in 2010 when he was only 17 years old. Today, he has more than 5 million subscribers on his page, with each video typically receiving over 500,000 views. He has also written two New York Times best-selling memoirs, launched a clothing line, a coffee brand, and a record label with a Sony distribution deal that specializes in pairing emerging musicians with powerful social media influencers. Franta has become a new type of digital mogul, something he credits to his ability to understand his audience. I know what I like and I found, through the years of YouTube, that people like what I like. How did a teenager from Minnesota gain this ability? Again, it started with consumptions. Quote, Before I even made YouTube videos, I was a viewer. I watched tons of YouTubers, and in a way, studied them and just understood YouTube before I got into it myself. Like Ted Sarandos's, Franta's consumption helped him develop a sense of what is familiar with his audience. Quote, Videos that always gained traction for me were anything I could find that was a relatable topic to anybody or especially to the majority of my audience. I found that people always wanted to talk to me about relationships or anything that was relatable to a teen, end quote. The other thing Franta realized was the huge role that novelty played in his success. It wasn't enough to merely understand his audience and what broad types of videos they would relate to. No, he had to offer something, a novel twist. On his side was timing. Many of the simple, relatable video ideas he came up with were inherently innovative. Back then, YouTube was a new frontier, Franta explained. Quote, there were no rules. I had to set the standard. End quote. By consuming lots of videos, he knew what his audience had seen and not seen, which cleared the way for him to create original but recognizable content. Without knowing it, Franta was making use of the creative curve. Among other things, Franta created a series of video lists, for example, 10 things to say to a boy you like. These videos hit the target for his tween and teenage audience and proceeded to rack up millions of views. Since then, Franta's videos have been copied by thousands of other YouTubers. So how deliberate and conscious is the process of coming up with ideas? The creative people I talked to, like Connor, were often aware of the mechanics that it took to develop and sharpen their consumer instincts. Nonetheless, they still talked about the resulting aha moments as if they were magical. Like Paul McCartney, Connor Franta describes his creative process in terms of sudden inspiration. Quote, Honestly, any idea I get, it just happens. For a YouTube video, I go to a coffee shop after this, I'll probably get an idea there because I see something happening, or maybe I'll get a clothing design idea because I see some pattern in the sky, and I'll literally jot it down. It just happens. End quote. 
he is a consistent his is a consistent experience across multiple fields. One day last year, I traveled to suburban Maryland to meet with Jose Andres, the celebrity chef who, along with his business partner Rob Wilder, owned over 20 high-end restaurants around the world. In addition, they own a fast casual chain, Beefsteak, and a Spanish package Good Lines, and have earned two Michelin stars for their food laboratory restaurant hybrid named Mini Bar. I pulled up in front of an ultra-modern house at 9 a.m. sharp and was greeted by Andres' assistant. I, as I heard the floorboards creak upstairs, I realized I was now guilty of waking up a celebrity chef. Before long, Andres, who has a thick Spanish accent mixed with the fast-talking locution of a kid on a playground, was ushering me into his kitchen. We sat down at his counter and drove right into the topic of creativity. Quote, The beginning of creativity is like the Big Bang. Why did it happen? We still don't know. End quote. He looked up and said, Anybody want coffee? He, proce he proceeded to take out a food scale to carefully measure out the perfect amount of espresso. As we got back to the task, Andres explained how, like other creators, he absorbs information about his field. He likes to attend chef conferences where he can observe the latest techniques and learn everything he can about new ingredients. To hear him tell it, the inspiration for his recipes also comes in sudden flashes. Andre says, quote, I have never liked the salt rim on a margarita. It's usually too much. End quote. Then one day he had an idea. He and his wife were on vacation, lying on a beach. Quote, as we were watching the waves crash into the shore, I thought about how light and salty those lit waves taste on your lips, and it hit me, end quote. A longtime user of sucro, a powdered emulsifier that creates interesting foam for his dishes, he suddenly thought, what if he emulsified salt? Quote, no more salt on the rim, just the salty sea flo foam floating on top of your margarita, end quote. And in that moment, the now popular salt air margarita was born. Andres, like other creative people I interviewed, experienced true moments of what felt like mystical flashes of inspiration. But if the creative curve offers a defined blueprint for consumer taste, why do these aha moments occur? Why isn't creativity more of a conscious process? And more important, can we all learn to create aha moments in our own lives? Being subtle. Imagine you are in a large room. Objects are strewn about here and there, among them a chair and a table on which there sits a pole with a hook on one end, a wrench, and an extension cord. On one side of the room, a long cord hangs from the ceiling to the floor. Another cord of the same length is hanging by the opposite wall. No, this is not a scene from a horror movie. It's the setting of a classic psychology study. The question researchers asked participants was simple. At least on the surface, can you tie the two cords together? The question is challenging, largely because of where the two cords are placed. For example, if a participant grabs one cord and walks it as far as he can in the direction of the other cord, he just can't reach that far. The participants are told they could use any item in the room that would help them, and also any technique that came to mind. Can you figure out a solution? The truth is, there's more than one. If you came up with, more, with one or more answers, congratulations. Most people struggle. Now, before patting yourself on the back, I have to break the news. There are four solutions in all. As a participant came up with one solution, one of the researchers would step forward and tell them, now do it a different way until they uncovered all four. Here's the first. You tie one cord to a heavy object, maybe the chair, and bring it between the two cords. Now fetch the other cord and bring it over. Here's the second way. You can use the extension cord to lengthen one cord before walking it over and tying it to the other one. Thirdly, you could use the pull to pull one of the cords while gripping the other. Fourth, you could tie the heavy wrench to one of the cords and turn it into a pendulum by swinging it. Then, as that cord swings back and forth, you could, again, walk the other cord over. The last solution is the one that intrigued the researchers the most, as it involved a kind of transformation. You had to turn the cord into a new object, a pendulum. Of the four solutions, this one was the least intuitive. Only 40% of the participant studies of the study's participants were able to figure out all four solutions without any assistance. 
If 10 minutes went by and the subjects hadn't yet figured out the fourth solution, the researchers began dropping hints. The first hint was subtle. The researcher would enter the room as if he was simply crossing it and suddenly brush the cord so that it started swinging. The hint prompted many of the participants to come up with the pendulum solution. On average, it took them less than a minute after the subtle hint was given for them to come up with the answer. The strange part is that only one student consciously made note of the subtle hint. Even when later told about what the researcher had done, the other, other students claimed that the brushed rope and the subtle swinging had no effect on their discovery. No, most claimed that the solution involving the wrench merely dawned on them in a moment of, well, you might call it inspiration. Even though the participants were, weren't aware of it, the subtle hint resulted in an aha moment. The two chords experiment shows us two things. First, solutions often show up suddenly in the guise of aha moments. The second and more important point is that even when these sorts of solutions feel like a sudden flash of genius, there is often a subliminal reason why we came up with them. They might not have been aware of it, but those students were unconsciously swayed, huh, pun, by the subtle swinging of the cord. This has big significance on our exploration of creativity. If scientists can prompt an aha moment in a study subject, is there a way that we can create them in ourselves? The Science of Aha Moments I want you to take a moment to study these three words. Cream, skate, water. Can you think of a single word that could be put next to all three and still make sense? The answer is ice, as in ice cream, ice skate, and ice water. If you came up with the solution, how did you do it? Did it pop into your head instantly? Or did you pour through various possible solutions? If you didn't get it all, what was your approach as you tried to figure it out? These kinds of word puzzles tend to fascinate scientists because, depending on the person's experiences, they can be solved either through logical analysis or via aha moments. Logical analysis is straightforward. You ponder whether a word works and think through the puzzle logically, step by step. Aha moments are the flashes of genius we've talked about throughout the book. With these solutions, the answer to the puzzle would come immediately upon seeing it or after a delay, but without conscious thought. Since these kinds of puzzles can be solved using either approach, they give researchers insights into the science of aha moments. Edward Bowden is a researcher at the University of Wisconsin Parkside. Bowden, along with a team from Northwestern University's Creative Brain Lab and Drexel University, sought to understand the neuroscience behind aha moments. Were they truly a magical experience, or was there perhaps a biological explanation for them? As part of their study, they tasked subjects to solve various of these word puzzles while connected to an EEG, electroencephalography monitor, which can quickly de detect the moments when electrical activity takes place in the brain, or an fMRI machine, which as a reminder, is the machine that can pinpoint where brain activity is taking place by measuring blood flow in the brain. Bowden and his team hoped that by using these two machines, they could see both when and where the brain was activated during aha moments. When connected to the EEG machine, the participants wore goggles that revealed one of the, world, the word puzzles and were given 30 seconds to solve it. Once they came up with an answer, they were then asked whether or not the solution came as an aha moment or as the result of logical analysis. 56% of the answers were attributed to an aha moment, 42% to logical analysis, while the remaining 2% checked neither box. On the surface, at least, there seemed to be a minimal difference between these two methods. Regardless of which one was experienced, the solutions showed up roughly 10 seconds later. But the EEG readings told a very different story. Electrical brain waves in the gamma band are thought to be activated when our brains engage in perception and language. It's one of the brain waves the scientists were most interested in studying. When participants solved problems via flashes of genius, there was a burst of gamma band activity 0.3 seconds before they came up with an answer. The researchers believe that this burst in electrical activity signals when the solution enters a person's consciousness. It represents the aha. This means that aha moments exhibit their own unique brainwave pattern. Have you ever looked at a crossword puzzle question and were unable to come up with a solution? 
Then, very suddenly, the answer hits you. Well, this feeling of being struck with a sudden solution is reflected by the activity in the gamma bands. So where exactly did the solution come from? To find out, Bowden and his team of researchers repeated the experiment while monitoring the subjects using an fMRI machine. What they found was that when participants reported aha moments, activity showed up in the right hemisphere of their brains. Not only do flashes of genius have a unique electrical pattern in the brain, they also have their own discrete location. It may be cliche to talk about the left brain and the right brain, but at the same time, it is critical to our understanding of where creative ideas originate. Generally speaking, the left hemisphere of our brain is where we process the dominant meanings of things. This is where we retrieve straightforward or contextually relevant definitions of words or concepts. When someone asks us what color the sky is, the left hemisphere of our brains shout out blue. The left hemisphere is also where logical analysis processing occurs. For example, our left hemisphere is activated when we're asked to solve complex math problems. Why? Because solving for X asks, asks that we bring specific relevant concepts to the forefront of our consciousness before we work through a step-by-step -step solution. This often feels like a slower process as we consciously have to work at something. The right hemisphere of our brains is where we store more metaphorical associations. Studies show that our right hemisphere is activated when we hear jokes that, say, rely on puns, or when we try to make sense of metaphors. The right hemisphere processes, processes problems by searching for associations between seemingly different concepts with underlying commonalities. This process is subconscious, meaning we're not aware of when our right hemisphere is at work in searching for connections. Sometimes it moves quickly. For example, when we hear a stand-up comedian's routine and automatically know why it's funny or not funny. Other times, our right hemisphere keeps working through a problem subconsciously, discovering a solution only much later. Since the right hemisphere operates below our general level of awareness, when it does come up with an answer, we are seldom aware of the effort it took, which is why we often experience this processing as more automated. As Bowden explains, the right hemisphere is processing language all the time, just like the left is. But what we're saying is that the structure of the two hemispheres is slightly different, and that connections in the left hemisphere are shorter, stronger, and to more direct associations, while the connections in the right hemisphere are longer, weaker, and to more distant associations. If I say worm, you might subconsciously, or you might consciously think fishing and earthworm, a left hemisphere activation. But in the right hemisphere, when I say worm, you might think fishing and earthworms, but also bookworm and gummy worm and even earworm, a song that gets stuck in your head and repeats endlessly. We don't consciously switch between processing in our right and left hemispheres either. Instead, our brains process problems in both hemispheres at the same time, the difference being that, as I mentioned, the processing of our right hemisphere generally operates beneath our level of conscious awareness. We don't even realize our brains are doing what they're doing, which is why all this unseen work ultimately leads to what we think of as aha moments. Researchers believe there are three origins of such aha moments. The first are what I call shower moments. In this scenario, you might already have a solution or something in your brain's right hemisphere, but the activity in your left hemisphere is crowding it out. Once the left hemisphere's logical processing fails to deliver an answer, its activity tends to fade. Once the left hemisphere's activity falls below that of the right hemisphere, the answer from the right hemisphere pops up as if by magic. Aha! This is why when we wake up, go out for a run, or take a shower, we often experience what feels to us like flashes of genius. Generally, these are occasions when our brains aren't overwhelmed with thoughts, the result being that we experience what seems like sudden inspiration. If you want to know the truth, it's really just the result of our brains being empty of the crowded chaos of our left brain thinking, which in turn allows long percolating right brain ideas to make their appearance. The second origin of aha moments is through combination. Here, your brain's right hemisphere, knowing that one single concept is unable to give a satisfactory answer, is subconsciously working to connect multiple concepts. If your right hemisphere is able to braid together what feels like a workable solution, 
it becomes activated. It is this sudden burst of brain activity that creates a flash of genius feeling. As we learned from the two chords experiment, the third origin of aha moments involves a trigger. In this case, an environmental factor subconsciously ignites an association with something already stored in your brain's right hemisphere. For example, if we get stuck working on a crossword puzzle and an hour later walk past the word we were seeking on a billboard, we may well experience a flash of genius without even being aware we saw the missing word. All three of these models happen below the average human being's conscious level of awareness. Is it any surprise, then, that these solutions often feel mystical and sent from above by some benevolent deity? In reality, it's not magic, it's biology. Bowden explained that aha moments are simply a normal cognitive process, but they have a surprising result. Latte art and brain processing. I want you to imagine that you are sitting in a crowded coffee shop with a friend. You're drinking an exquisitely crafted cappuccino. Somehow the barista sketched a heart into the foam, not difficult, and catching up on life. At the table next to yours, a couple is having an intimate conversation. Even though their table is only a few feet away, you don't really hear what they're saying. Your focus, after all, is on your friend and your cappuccino. All of a sudden, you hear a person at the adjoining table utter your first name. Just as suddenly, you can't help but listen in on your conversation for a few seconds. When you quickly realize that they're talking not about you, but about someone else with the same name, you refocus on your friend and your foam heart, and the conversation taking place at the table next to yours fades into the background. One of your brain's core competencies is its ability to filter the world around us for things that are important, things that matter. In neuroscience, important is defined as something that's either potentially harmful or potentially helpful. Your brain is constantly scanning the world around you for this kind of information. When it decides that someone or something will neither harm nor help you, it quickly ignores the stimulus in question. How does our brain do this? Well, it uses both your memories and mental models in a constant assessment of whether someone or something is a potential source of danger or reward. As I wrote earlier, it accomplishes this by gauging how familiar or novel something is. For example, let's go back to the coffee shop. Chances are when you walked in, you didn't consciously notice the chairs. They're just chairs after all. Well, what if they were exact replicas of the ones you have in your kitchen? I could almost guarantee that your attention would have been drawn to those chairs. So how does this process of recognition work? Bowden explains that the sight of a recognizable chair automatically activates an existing memory instead of you having to go through and think, oh, what kind of chair is that? The strength of this activation typically causes it to pop into your consciousness. On the other hand, if you see a chair that deviates from your image of how a chair should look, that is, the prototype, you would notice it as well because your brain would be working hard to decide what in the world you're looking at and whether or not it's safe. Objects that are similar to an exemplar and objects that vary from our stored prototypes cause substantial activity in your brain. This concept of awareness is important because it helps explain why people think that flashes of insight are magical. Since we are not aware of the work that goes into them, they feel like they take no effort. Another reason that they seem supernatural is that people report that many of their greatest ideas originate from, well, aha moments. When discussing their creative processes, they describe how their best ideas come to them seemingly out of nowhere in places like the aforementioned shower. One survey, by a shower company, of course, found that 72% of consumers reported solving problems in the shower. They didn't remember the truly rotten ideas that also accompany their morning shower that their brains subconsciously discarded. All this is to say that most of us tend to correlate aha moments with valuable ideas. I found that many of the creative people I interviewed similarly revered their own aha moments. One evening last year, I traveled to a Greek restaurant in its sleepy Malibu to have dinner with Mike Eisinger, or Einziger. He is the co-songwriter and guitarist for the band Incubus, one of today's best-selling alternative rock bands, with over 23 million albums sold. Mike also writes for orchestras, serves as a producer for other musicians, and collaborates with electronic artists. For example, he co-wrote the electronic hit Wake Me Up with Avicii, 
which sold 11 million copies. That said, the person Einziger could easily be mistaken for a, gradu a graduate student. With long, shaggy hair, he wouldn't look entirely out of place strolling along a campus quad or studying in the stacks of the campus library. For many years, in fact, he did just that. Taking a hi hiatus from his life as a rock star, he attended Harvard, where he studied physics. Einziger gave me the example of the song Drive, Incubus's biggest hit. He had experienced a rush of inspiration where the music came to him. He then took it to his co-songwriter and lead singer, Brandon Boyd. The lyrics quickly followed from there. Quote, I remember sitting in my car and Brandon just sang what he sang over the top of it. And that ended up being the song. End quote, he says. The process consisted of multiple flashes of genius, giving it an almost magical quality. The two songwriters didn't argue or fight. Rather, this huge hit simply clicked. Why, though? If aha moments can be traced back to a single biological experience, why do the ideas they generate often feel better than ideas that we work out via logical analysis? When I asked Bowden this question, it turned out that he and his fellow researchers at the Creative Brain Lab were eager to find answers to the same question. Working alongside a team of Italian researchers, they employed a variety of puzzles that could be solved either by logical analysis or via a flash of sudden inspiration. They then measured the accuracy of both sets of answers. It turns out that the reason people believe their aha moments are special is that, in fact, they are. The research team found that solutions generated by a seemingly flash of genius were more likely to be correct than answers worked out through logical analysis. The reason is simple and not mystical. Using a logical analysis approach, your brain exposes you to fragments and partial answers as it toils subconsciously uh, through the problem in question. As this is happening, you are usually aware of the wrongness of your ideas, but when you're not sure of something, you may take a risk and guess. As a result, your answers aren't always correct. By contrast, aha moments typically take place only once a complete and accurate answer is found by your brain's right hemisphere. Since we're not aware of how hard our right hemisphere is working to find answers, or of the bad ideas that subconsciously discarded, it feels as though aha moment type processing is always correct. This is why these moments are often experienced as flashes of genius. Whether we're discussing Connor Franta suddenly getting the idea for a clothing design when looking at the sky, or Paul McCartney waking up one morning with the chords for yesterday, Flashes of genius are far from a, a mystical experience. Rather, they are an ordinary process that your brain subconsciously uses to address and solve problems and connect seemingly distant but associated concepts. Considering that they are more likely to be correct than a solution realized through logical analysis, our culture has created a mythology around these flashes of genius. The thing is, they're just a normal, if spectacular, function of our brains. And the best news is that they can be enhanced. Building a foundation. The reason the 20% principle is consistent among the creative artists I interviewed is that it provides the building blocks that are necessary for aha moments to flourish. This accumulation of prior knowledge fills up the brain with examples and concepts that artists then use to uncover non-obvious insights. Bowden explained the importance of establishing prior knowledge, quote, I think one of the problems people have with the idea of insight is if they think it's a magical process, they think that they shouldn't have to work hard to have an insight. But what you need to do is you have to establish a certain level of knowledge. You can't have insights about things you don't know anything about, end quote. And that line is worth repeating. You cannot have insights about things you don't know anything about. Aha moments tend to drive a lot of the mythology that's been constructed around creativity. At the same time, there is some truth to both their power and their hype, since, as we've seen, aha moments are generally more accurate than, and superior to, normal step-by-step -step logical processes. But, as a normal cognitive function, they are also something we can enhance in practice. Want to become a great writer? Start consuming all the books you can get your hands on. Need to write better dialogue in your scripts? Start listening to people talking at coffee shops, but don't be creepy about it. Want to become a great television executive? Watch TV day and night. 
The 20% principle gives us the raw ingredients our brains need to generate aha moments. We need to have the memories and mental models for our right hemisphere to work with. Without these ingredients, we are shutting down our potential. This element of bulk consumption is widespread across all creative industries. Connor Franta spent years watching countless YouTube videos. Great entrepreneurs consume trade and industry material en route to identifying their next lucrative business. Jose Andres visits food and restaurant conventions to observe and absorb new techniques and get introduced to the latest ingredients. The 20% principle not only makes flashes of genius possible by providing lots of exemplars, it also allows for creative people to gain insight into what will be familiar through cultural awareness. Ted Sarandos' experience working in a video store made it possible for him to understand what kinds of stories, formats, and structures his audience would perceive as similar to other movies they loved. By understanding where an idea would fall on the creative curve then and today, he was able to lead Netflix to incredible heights in original programming. If your goal is to achieve mainstream success, your first step should be to immerse yourself in the field you are interested in, exposing yourself to and consuming as much as possible. This will allow you to identify areas that are familiar to previous successes. But wait one second. Before you start consuming books, CDs, movies, or television shows, I need to point out one possible conundrum. The fact is, many of us are already consuming massive amounts of material. According to the U.S. Department of Labor, the average American watches three hours of television every day, which which comes to roughly 20% of their waking hours. On the surface, aren't most Americans already following the 20% principle when it comes to gaining experience about what works and doesn't work on TV? If we are all consuming huge amounts of television, why aren't more of us creating hit shows? Consumption's primary role is to help you identify something's level of familiarity. But the creative curve also demands that you create the right amount of novelty. It's not enough to simply identify novelty. You have to add just the right amount. To do this, creatives consistently engage in something that may seem surprising. And that is imitation. Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, and visit my channel for more exciting content.